Okay, Brett Kirby, the guy that I only half jokingly refer to as the busiest man, the hardest working man in showbiz in Cleveland. <laughs> um, let's start with the 10 by 3 because that's how I met you and um, found out about all of your projects. So, 2010, mm -hmm. you started it. Yes. June, what June was what was the impetus behind that? Why did you do that? I wanted to start an open mic. I, I needed work, and so I wanted a regular gig. And Brothers had offered me a Wednesday, but I didn't want to do just an open mic. I wanted there to be some structure to it. And when I lived in Nashville uh, for a couple of years, um, there was a an event called Twelfth on Twelfth, Twelfth and Porter, and that was hosted by Daniel Tashin, who's an incredible songwriter and producer. And it was two two songs, and they'd have twelve bands, and and uh, it was on every Monday night, and it was just this great, you know, example of community, and you just see some great, amazing music, and and it was just it was just a great thing to be involved in, and so I wanted that kind of feeling um, with the open mic, and so then I started to put some structure on it, put some rules. I was like, okay, it's got to be original, you know, you can do one cover. It's three songs each, ten songwriters, and you can do it's two originals and then one original or cover artist choice. Because some people have, you know, good versions of sure covers that they'd want to do or share, and that's cool. You know, I just didn't want it to be like, you know, someone going up there playing three cover songs that everyone knows, and then someone goes up and plays their originals and right. that they wrote in their living room, and maybe they're not at the same. The songs aren't at the same level as, you know, Brown Eyed Girl or whatever. Not that even that's a comparison. But the sure. whole point was that I, I wanted to create an environment and a safe space for original music to be heard. And so that was um, the structure, you know, signing up ahead of time so everyone knew when they were playing. That was the thing that always bothered me about open mics is, you know, you'd show up and you'd put, you'd put on a list, but you didn't know necessarily when you were playing. So it was really hard to actually market it and tell people you're going to be playing because they didn't want to have to hang out for three hours necessarily. Some people didn't have that amount of time, but with the 10 by 3, you have a time slot, you know when you're going to play, people can come out and see you play and they can hang out, or if it's a, you know, because it's a Wednesday night, maybe they need to go home and go to bed. So they go home and go to bed and, and they can still see the person who they want to see. So yeah. I just wanted a structure, I wanted a safe space, I wanted a community aspect to it all. And so the whole idea, too, was just to create a, a space where uh, musicians could support each other and audience members could support the musicians and the songwriters, um, but we could be good examples of how to be good listeners. And that was a big part of it to me, too, was to, to, to train people like, hey, people are playing their own music and we need to respect that and we need to listen. Because how many times do you go to a coffee shop or a little cafe or something where there's an acoustic musician playing and everybody's just blabbering away in the right. background? And, you know, those gigs those gigs are those kind of gigs. And, you know, I think the people who do those kind of gigs are signed up for those type of gigs, and that's what they should expect. Yeah. Um, but in this environment, I wanted it to be an oasis. Like, if I could have a perfect world of audience and musician slash songwriter what would it look like and that's what i've tried to create and the other, the other thing about open mics too is that you can show up and find out that the list is already full and you can't even play even though you've lugged all your equipment there yeah i didn't want any of that yeah you know i wanted it to be easy and i wanted it to be respectful and i wanted it to be a show it you know i think of the 10 by 3 not like an open mic but i think of it more like a showcase mm -hmm. it's a scheduled showcase of musicians that know what they're doing when they get there and know when they're playing. And, um, you know, it's like, I've been on the scene for a really long time and it used to be once upon a time that musicians did support each other. And then all of a sudden that just seems to have gone away. I've been to so many shows, you know, really great shows or whatever and don't see any of the other musicians coming to support the people that are playing. Mm -hmm. And, but this 
is something, like you said, you know, to form that community where the musicians do support each other and they come out and they watch each other play and sometimes they collaborate or whatever. Or it makes for other collaborations somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. And those connections mean something. Absolutely. Yeah. And so little seeds, you know. Yeah, right. So um, one of the other unique aspects about the 10 by 3 are the special nights. Mm -hmm. that you do. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's the holiday show, but you've got a Dylan show that you do. Yeah, there's ever since we started, uh, a guy named Sir Lawrence Trupo was a huge Dylan fan, and so he was there from kind of the get-go and was uh, very much a, 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 you know, taking pictures of everybody and, and writing great songs and going up performing, much like yourself in, in, in a way. And... Uh, Thank so, but he, he, he wanted to do a Dylan night, theme night, and I was like, sure, that sounds great, because I love Bob Dylan, and I'll, you know, there's nothing wrong with learning a Bob Dylan song, like, that's not going to hurt anybody, it's mm -hmm. only going to make somebody a better songwriter by learning a Dylan song, and uh, it's so, but it was the night before Thanksgiving, we always had that, and uh, since we do it at the Bop Stop now, it's the first and third, so we do it on the third uh, the closest, the, the closest one yeah. to that, and so we had the Dylan night, you know, we've done... Other artists like uh, Tom Petty, we've done, you know, 80s night uh, where people have to do an 80s song. Um, we've done Cleveland night where, you know, songs about Cleveland. We've done play your, play your friends songs night. So we oh, wow. come out and play their friends songs, you know, and their friend can show up and hear their song song. And that's a pretty cool thing. Um, we have uh, prompt nights where... Uh, forward prompt nights where we, you know, have pick forwards out of a hat and everyone writes a song. Everyone that evening writes a song based upon those four words. How did so, you come up with that idea? Because that's that's one of the coolest ones that you got. I think. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think it came from the teaching that I did uh, with the Ohio Arts Council and and was teaching in the schools that you know it was just a prompt. It was a way to get kids to write songs that were kind of focused. You know, when you have a target, it's much easier to write a song almost. And so by having four words, it's kind of like, okay, well, I know that this is going to be a certain aspect of this song, so therefore you're kind of just walking in that direction automatically. And so I just wanted to uh, try it, and it worked really well. And so it's something that I do. I try to do once a quarter at this point. I have it scheduled this year to be once every three months we'll have a prompt night. Yeah, it's kind of Because like, it helps me write songs, too. You know, it's mm -hmm. just an output of, like, oh, hey, I, I'm going to go and play the play a new song on a certain date, so i got to get cracking. And it, it's kind of like Mad Libs for music, in a way. A little bit, yeah. You know, because, I mean, you get all... You get these four words that have absolutely nothing to do with one mm -hmm. another, mm -hmm. and it really, it really does get those creative juices flowing, because, you know, like, the, the few that I've seen have worked out really, really well. Yeah. And they can be funny. Oh, yeah. Super that funny. Mean, yeah. That's... And I think the idea, too, is to, to, to not, you know... They don't have to use the words verbatim. They could use, uh, you know, what the, the, a metaphor for the word, or, uh -huh. or they the could use it as a, it. the concept behind it. And so then, what happens is, is you, you know, I always try with the four word prompts to find the connection between the words, you know. And so I do a deep dive. Of, you know, I do Google, Google searches and Wikipedia's and definitions and and G, even pictures and all sorts of things until I find the thread that runs between those four words. And there always is some type of thread, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I can always connect them in my mind and that's just my process, but I feel like other people have come to that conclusion too, that, you know, these four words do work together. Everybody seems you know? to have been able to do it really well. Everybody yep. seems to really enjoy doing it, you know, because it does, it, it, it puts a little bit of pressure there that they might otherwise not have. Right. That maybe they need to kickstart something. And so. the deadline of the of the date that you got to play it works. For right. People. Absolutely. Got to finish the song by then. So then they finish it. Now they have a brand new song and... Uh, a bunch of people that have performed those songs and written those songs have gone out and and done great things with those songs. You know, filmed videos, "Kiss Me Deadly." They they did a video for their uh, song "Skylark," which got in some some film uh, shows and, oh, and cool. competitions. And so it's pretty it's a pretty cool thing to see those kind of things happen. 
Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, so you mentioned the Bob Stop. Originally, you were doing this at Brothers Wine Bar, and then COVID happened, of course, you know, mm -hmm. and and that one closed down. And so, how did how did getting into the Bob Stop happen? Because um, that's such a great place, and and every time I talk to somebody who plays there for the very first time, they say, "Oh my." God, I've never played in a room that sounds this great. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful venue, and it has the back line of the Steinway Grand and the drum set and the Fender Twin and the Ampeg bass amp. I mean, it's got everything. It's got a nice PA. It's got lights for pictures. You know, so people are looking for promo material. They can use that performance as all the promo they need. Here I am live playing in front of an audience because they videotape everything and stream it. Um, and you can take great pictures. And it's so, uh, for me, I think that was really what I was looking for and when the bot stop came to my mind of like first of all when COVID happened I was like I thought to myself I said well you know maybe this is just the end of the era you know maybe this is just the end of the 10 by 3 and then I you know who knew what was going to happen with COVID and as it came on and as it was passing and other venues opened up brothers didn't open up and so I just kind of thought well I'm going to wait and see you know there's no rush to do any of this and and brothers opened up um and they did away with the wine bar, uh, which is where the 10 by 3 was, and all those great moments happened, and it just wasn't going to be the same. And so then I thought of other places that could, you know, house that type of uh, event, and I thought of the Bob Stop, and so I made a presentation to Gabe Pollock, who was, the, the, who was running the Bob Stop at that time, and, and he was all in on it. Um, it's mainly a jazz club, but uh, they do... Uh, you know, kind of branch out into some other things, and this is one of them, and I was really lucky to be able to get it there. Yeah, I'm glad you did, because, I mean, it really is my favorite place in Cleveland to see a, to see a show. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a music venue. There are no TVs in there, you know? That, I mean, as, 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 as it, well, it should be. Yeah. And it already was a listening room, and now it's, you know, I really don't have to work that hard to shush people. Right, you know? absolutely. Which is good. So, um, so one of the first times that... Um, I saw that ten by three. Um, you were wearing a T-shirt that said "New Soft Shoe," and this is one of your other projects. So that's all Grand Parsons all the time. Yes, or of some form or other, whether it's the birds or his solo material. Anything that he played, it's fair game for us. That's the rule. He had, he, we you, had we have to know that he played it at some point. How how did you come about putting that together? Why did you choose Graham Parsons to do? Well, when I was in college, and then I went to college at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I'm from Wisconsin, and so um, we had a great community of people. Of musicians and bands, and one of the one of the bands kind of branched off and got together a separate band that did some Graham Parsons covers, and and at the same time it was it was uh, uh, I, I got a hold of a Graham Parsons CD, and, and man, it was just like you know certain records hit, hit you at the right time, right, and they resonate, and it was exactly what I was wanting to hear, exactly what I was searching for, the sound that I heard in my head. It was like, oh my gosh. Like that, that, that's it. And um, so I listened to Grand Parsons nonstop for years. I mean, <laughs> when I say nonstop, I mean, you go in my car, it was Grand Parsons. You go home, it was Grand Parsons. I was working construction, and I had a boombox, and there was a Grand Parsons CD <laughs> that never left, you know. So it was just, I really love those songs. And so when I moved to Cleveland, um, I met, uh, I was running Sam Ash Music. I was the GM for Sam Ash Music. And so I got to meet a lot of musicians right away when I moved here. And one of them was Al Moss, who was a pedal steel player with a band called Hillbilly Idol. And uh, I met him and we talked about Graham. And, and, I, and I said, hey, you know, would you be interested at some point getting together and doing some Graham Parsons tunes? He said, absolutely. And so a bunch of years passed. And, uh, but then... I ended up getting a regular gig at the Happy Dog on the, the second Thursdays of every month. And I did it for a year, and this was before hot dogs and tater tots. It was They were doing <laughs> pierogies, and I had a full menu and different owners. Um, and then it ended up, um, you know, I just was like, hey, let's just drunk and dare. Let's show up and play, you know, 30 Graham Parsons songs. Who's in? And, and uh, there was this d d group of musicians that were like, yeah. It's not the same group we have now, a few different people, but a lot of the core people were there at the beginning. And, 
and uh, we started doing it. And then from there, it's just been the second Thursday uh, outside of COVID since then. So that's 2010 as well. So I started 10 by 3 and the, the new Saw Shoe in 2010. And it's just kind of grown. Uh, we're at Four City Brewery now on the second Thursdays of every month. And um, it's just been a really another community that has been built around uh, a certain thing, you mm -hmm. know. And, and uh, you know, I, I know for sure that we have earned and made Graham Parsons fans in, in Cleveland. And, I, I, you know, when people come from that Graham Parsons community to Cleveland to see us in the new Saw Shoe, they're, they're amazed, you know, at, at uh, just the connection that has happened be and the community that has happened because of that. So uh, really, really proud of that. And it's fun. We're playing the Beachland Tavern tonight, so it's going to be a good time. It's, it, it, it's a very tight band. And um, actually, I, I think we're coming tonight. Oh, I great. Think. Cool. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta check with Jim because you know, we were talking about that because I saw that you were doing that. Um, the other thing um, you mentioned, you know, like the people that you got playing with you. One of those guys is Andy Leach, mm -hmm. who uh, runs the library at Rock, Rock Hall, Hall, Hall of Fame, Fame. Yeah, okay. um, and he is the. Th thread that ties all of your projects almost all of your projects together i mean him and i played music for years and recorded records and and played lots of gigs and uh, south by southwest together and and uh just we've 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 been brothers for a long time and so um yeah he's one of you know i think as you go through life uh musicians are kind of like good friends and there's some that you just kind of gravitate towards and and uh you trust and he is one of those guys for me. So it, it really doesn't matter what I'm doing musically. I could see Andy fitting in any of it. Mm -hmm. And and um, Doug McKean and the Stuntmen. That's another one. You know, and he's in that group as well. I'm with Doug with uh, the Ohio City Singers, the Christmas band. And uh, Doug plays in the Bush in the County Hell. And so he, he's uh, had some great solo material and and uh for for a long time and and i i played with doug years ago i played drums and then he started a new version of this band uh, with my best friend bible latina from the jack fours my other band on guitar and and then andy's playing bass and i'm playing drums so for me to play drums behind a great songwriter is all i really want to do i love playing drums and i love playing doug songs and i love looking over and seeing andy and and Bobby and we're all just great friends and so that band is just a super super fun and focused band. It's great. Um, yeah, you mentioned playing drums. Um, that's another aspect. Um, you play drums. You play guitar. You play piano. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you play? Because I mean, like you got Prince Tucker. I mean, this. That kid is oh, amazing. amazing and Super plays talented. like I think every instrument ever invented. Yeah, he's great. He's so, amazing. so how do you go from like one to the other to another? Because they're all so wildly uh, different. Uh, yeah, I mean, and the songs. I mean, you know, the stuff that you do, the Grand Parsons stuff is one thing. The solo material is mm -hmm. another thing. Uh, the duet is another thing. Jack Ford's another thing. Devin Keen is another thing. And how do you go from like one instrument to another and one song or one style of song and keep it all straight? Because there's just so many things that you need to know. Well, I mean, I think that that's just focus and, you know, just doing it. I've always done since college, you know, I've been doing all of those things in some way, shape or form. And so... Uh, to me, that's not even, in, I don't even have to think about jumping from one to the next. And and uh, it's just all, uh, it's all on my plate, you know, and it just, what do I, what am I going to eat next? Well, I'll just eat this because it's right there, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. I, I, I really don't have to, it's not a switch in my mind or necessarily that goes outside of just like, okay, what equipment do I need tonight? <laughs> that's, that's the only switch I have to think about. Everything else just kind of is very natural and feels uh, very, you know, I don't have to think about it. It's very mm. unconscious. That's really good. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the Jack Fords. Jack Fords, been around since 2005. Uh, Bobby Latina uh, played guitar, played guitar in the, in, in the Cow Slingers, 
and then we met at a place called the Town Fire, and they had this cool little like Roots Americana scene on Sunday nights there every week, and uh, that's where I met Bobby, and that's where we recorded our first CD, a live CD there at the Town Fryer, and and uh, from there, you know, we just started uh, playing a bunch of shows and, you know, playing three-hour shows and writing more songs and doing some recording, and and uh, it's a really fun band. It's a completely different catalog versus my solo stuff. Um, some of the tunes kind of meander back and forth, but most of it, it's it's a separate catalog, and, and as of late, Bobby and I have been you know, writing everything together. Uh, they've all been co-writes, uh, where in the past it was a lot of me doing the writing and then introducing it to the band, but now it's a much more collaborative effort between Bobby and I. And uh, and I think the songs reflect that. I think the songs are really strong and well thought out, and we're writing the lyrics together, so they're meaningful to both of us. And, and um, you know, we're hoping to... Uh, we're working, uh, you know, on a new record, hopefully to record this year. It's been a long time, and... We need to do it, um, but that band's been a, been a really fun, fun thing to do because it's a band I get to go out and I get to just, <laughs> and it feels good to do that, you know. <laughs> right. I, I get to scream. I get to you know be loud and and rock and 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 uh, in kind of a balls to the wall kind of way, and that really feels good to do. Yeah, I can imagine because I mean, well. Doug McKean is, you know, rock and roll and everything. But Completely. the other stuff is... But I'm playing drums in that stuff, so it's a different... The drums, going back to what you are saying, like the, the, the difference between the two, drums is a much more primal thing to me. Like, people can hit things sure. very easily. Uh, and creating rhythms and that type of thing is just a very much... A, it's a uh, just a coordination of limbs and thought. and um, I can imagine something in my head and play drums with it where... Playing guitar and singing is a much more cerebral thing. I really have to think about that uh, and think about the process of singing and and using that instrument and playing guitar and playing that as an instrument. Where where drums is just I'm just hitting stuff. Mm. So yeah, well, yeah, I you know I've I've always been amazed by singing drummers because mm, yeah. of that very thing. Mm-hmm. You've got to have that headspace, you know, where you're thinking of those vocals. And everything, but at the same time, it's like this hand's doing this, this hand's doing this, this foot's doing this, this foot's doing this, and you got to be able to coordinate all of that stuff and sing it and separate that rhythm from the musicality of a vocal line, yeah, and singing a melody. And I find, uh, you know, when you when you get to the point, and it takes me a little bit. Like I've sang and played drums for shows before, and it takes just a, a few songs to get my balance but once I do it's really kind of great because uh, as a drummer like you're just leading everything so if I want to play like this I can do it and I can sing like it and I can coordinate my voice with the drums and do the kicks and do the dynamics of how I want to do it and the band kind of doesn't have a choice they kind of got to follow there's a lot of control when you're singing and playing drums and I think LeVon Helm from the band pointed it out too there's an instructional video of him and he's just singing and playing and you can see that it's very much a uh it's 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 two different things but it's one body doing it right and uh it's a really really fun thing to do to play drums and sing yeah i mean you got mcfleetwood that does that mm-hmm. you know i mean obviously ringo and naturally you know mm-hmm. Pete, uh, keith Moon used to you know periodically or whatever so yeah, I I always found that to be people, people frown on the on the. I think they look they look at the the, the singing drummer as kind of a novelty. Yeah, to like what's supposed to happen, right? You know, yeah, that like, guy they hear a voice and they're like, "Who's singing?" It's not any. Oh, it's the drummer. Yeah, you know? that guy's supposed to be. That guy's supposed to be in the back holding the band together. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, he's supposed to be hidden behind symbols in the. Drum or the singer's ass or something and everything else, yes. Yeah. So, um, so, so, okay. So you've got a, a Jack Ford's record that you're in the process of working on. Anything with uh, McKean or? Um, we're working on new songs. We're, we, you know, it's a band that's we've been over. We've been together for over a year, kind of practicing regularly. So, and Doug just has a huge catalog of songs. So we've been kind of mining that catalog, and uh, every show we try to introduce new songs and try to curate the show to new songs and, and Doug's constantly writing as well. But w- recently we started um, 
collaborating, you know, just getting together and for rehearsal and, you know, we just work on a song and then we record it and we think about it and we come back the next week and we work on it some more. And so there's been a couple tunes that we've already done um, that are almost ready for us to play out and we're going to keep doing that and then the goal is to, you know, record a record with the band, um, not just Doug doing all that because he's so talented too, he can play the keys and the, and the guitars and the saxophones and all the stuff. Uh, but this would be a band record where we would go in as a band and play, which I think would be pretty great. Ooh, and um, any thoughts about recording new soft shoe? Yeah, yeah. I've been, at, you know, funny enough, the year, and it's something I've had in the back of my brain for a long time, um, is to, to take that band and, and uh, you know, we've all only done Grand Parsons songs and, we never rehearse. We've rehearsed three times in all the years that we've done it, and it's really just been like we show up, and sometimes we fail miserably at the songs, and sometimes we hit it out of the ballpark. But we're always listening, and the next time we play it, we do remember what we, what we were doing or things that didn't work, and sometimes we mention things. So it's something that we've that band has kind of grown by osmosis, really. But one thing I've really wanted to do is take that band in, into the studio with some original songs and and uh, apply the, what we know to those new songs that would be in the vein of that kind of music. The Grand Parsons style, more yeah, or less. Yeah, more or less, you know. And, um, and Well, I mean, you know, you've been listening to it for so long. Right. I, I mean, it's, imagine it would not be all It's that in there, you too. know. And, and I think that it... Um, just recently, though, in the last bunch of months, there's been a bunch of tunes that have been coming out and I've started to make a list of songs and you know I think if we were to do a Graham Parsons record uh, or a New South Shoe record it would be a, a few of Graham Parsons songs and the cool arrangements that I think are cool that we've come up with of those songs uh, that people have told us oh that's a really great way that you do that song do some of those and then you know um, have like you know six or seven original tunes that that um, that I've written that come to that and, and also you know Andy writes and Al Moss uh, is a great songwriter uh, he's not playing with the band currently but you know he's still writing songs and and so it would be fun to do some of his songs and Tom Prebish is doing some songwriting and so it would be fun to collaborate on some songs and and uh, and put some original stuff out there so I think that'll happen I don't know exactly when but we'll see yeah yeah that'd be great so um, and then um, to wrap things up, come back to the beginning and the ten by three. Um, obviously, you know this is going to be going on for a while. Um, the jazz night. Um, I did want to talk about that because mm -hmm. when when you did that last year, that was just worked out so incredibly well um, to get all these. And, and and this is the same thing that happens with Outlab. I, I swear to God, this place is magical. Mm. Uh, I agree, it's magical. Because the same thing happens with Outlab. You get all these disparate musicians together who play all these different styles of jazz. They all get up on stage together and never played well. As time goes on, that becomes a community too, and people do mm -hmm. end up playing together. But basically, you know, it's like all these people come in with all their own styles, and there's just something, I don't know, they just, all the great music that's been in there, they just absorb it and then put it back out, and it's like this continuous feedback loop. And I think the same thing idea. happens at a 10 by 3 mm -hmm. like with Jazz Night, because here you had your jazz musicians that were up there we had four who I don't think played were, with each other before. Uh, they, 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 some of them had played together, for sure. And then you get one of the regular people scheduled for that night. Every songwriter that night gets to, gets to play, play, with play a the song band. with the band backing them up, and that's and a really cool thing. It worked so well. Yeah, it was kind of an experiment, and uh, Brian Kennard, who is now running the Bop Stop, uh, it, it, we kind of had this, you know, little seed of an idea when we first started, but we kind of just punted it down the road a little bit. But then uh, we both, you know, were talking about it, like we should just do it. And so we figured out how to do it and, and make sure that everyone was, you know, paid, uh, you know, that those jazz musicians were paid for their time to, to learn all those songs. You know, that wasn't uh, any small feat by any means. And, 
and go up there and play. And, and we're going to do two of those this year. Oh, we have cool. two that we're going to do, one in April and then one in October. Uh, on the third weeks of those months, we will have uh, the jazz musicians back up the songwriters for that particular night, which will be great. Great, so there's a lot of stuff to look forward to coming up this year. I'm really going to try to make it interesting, you know, and I feel, you know, like if it's an event, um, some people shy away from the theme nights because they, they don't want to play Bob Dylan's song or they don't want to, you know, they don't want to write a song or they just want to come up and play their songs. And so I feel like there's a balance of that and then there's a balance of the theme nights, you know, and I could almost think of it like, you know, once a month we're going to have one of those two is going to have something happening, hopefully, you know. So for musicians out there who want to get involved in the 10 by 3 and I highly recommend that you do, um, what's your lead time? I know because, I know it's pretty far out there because the last one I played was in September and I wasn't able to get another slot till February. So it's so about three, four months. Three, four months At this out. point, yeah. It, you know, when I was doing it every week at Brothers, um, I was usually around two weeks ahead, you know, but there were, it was every Wednesday. The fact that it's the first and third and only two Wednesdays a month, um, you know, it, 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 there's a lot more demand for time slots. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the issue of trying to, to do all that. And I hate, you know, people want to come in and they want to play the next week or something and I have to push them off or three, four months, and I hate doing that. But it, it, on the other hand, it does, I think, make the performance and the opportunity a little bit more special and more unique. And I think people come in uh, just kind of thinking that, oh, okay, this is it. Like, this, I really want to come in and do something good for this. Because, you know, and I, and I feel that's, that, that the minimal amount of time slots on a given night uh, in, a, in a given month has really kind of up the performance you know, uh, from everybody and made it just a more special thing. Yeah, because it's something to look forward to mm -hmm. down the line. And, and I mean, you've played it and you work on stuff up to it because you know when you're playing yeah. and you're like, okay, I'm going to make this, this is going to be a statement. You know, this yeah. is going to be something. I'm going to come in and do this. And uh, For me, it's a little tough sometimes because I come in and I, I do it every time and, and I try not to repeat songs and and uh, there's, there's been a handful of songs that I have repeated in the time that we've done at Bob Stop, but it's, I really have tried to like, okay, either write a new song or bring up a new song or rearrange an old song or do something different every time. So I even view it as an opportunity to do something unique and different yeah. every time. Well, I mean, you know, you, you've got the other projects that you do. You can do one of the, something that you do with Andy. You can do something mm -hmm. that you do with Doug. You can do something that you do with Jack Fords. You can do a Graham Parsons song, mm -hmm. because cover song. Yep. You know. There's, so, lot, there's lots of possibilities. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I like going into it thinking, okay, what am I going to do? This is going to be cool. And I... I you know, work on the songs or whatever it is. And very rarely, I think, do I show up. And Although with, the interesting thing is, and you've probably experienced this too, that I play at the end of the night. So the vibe of the night is really dependent on the people that are there. And so the three songs that I think I might do at the beginning <laughs> of the night, sometimes there's an a, a unwritten theme. Sometimes there's just a vibe. Sometimes I just change my mind because I hear a song and that inspires me. Oh, that reminds me of this song. I want to do that song now. And so very rarely are the three songs that I plan on doing at the beginning of the night are the same ones that I do when I play. Yeah, well, you know, like, like you're saying, sometimes there's a vibe. Like, for instance, one that I can think of immediately is the one where... Um, there were two Puerto Rican acts and a Brazilian act. It was crazy. And that was a crazy. That thing. just happened to come together that way, and it happened to come together because people they were going to Puerto Rico. Uh, these musicians, and it was a group of them. So they were they had two different songwriters, and they they their flight got canceled. <laughs> and I ended up having two open slots because people had canceled, and it was like they just moved right in. And I had Moises Borges, who was. Brazilian, he was already scheduled, and man, that was an incredible, incredible night. I couldn't even have 
planned something like that. I know, and you know, it's really, it's, it's really funny the way things worked out because I was originally supposed to go on just before Moises, mm -hmm. and because he was running late, I ended, no, I was supposed to go on after him, mm -hmm. but because he was running late, I got to go on before him, and I thank God I did because. His set was just like the highlight of the night. Yeah, I had to go on after that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, mean, you know, I did okay. You I, did I, okay. I, yes. I don't think I lit it up like they did. Yeah. yeah, and 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 that was great because I got the opportunity to to see a really great band, and then I, you know, shot his um, CD release. You know, a few oh, weeks right. later, yeah. and he had a Bob stop out, again. At yeah. the Bob stop, yeah, and that worked out really, really well. And I think he's playing there this weekend um, again. So, so yeah, that was that was really great. And and this is the other thing too about the ten by three is that um, yeah, there's some repeat people that come through and and everything, but. For each one of these nights, I mean, just the plethora of, of musicians of really, really great quality that play this, that don't really get many op other opportunities to play. There may be a coffee shop on a corner someplace or another open mic someplace or whatever. And here, and especially because they live stream here, they get the opportunity to be able to you know, get their, their stuff out there, get people noticing them. That's why I shoot them, so that I can put it out there. And everybody's, you know, like, been really thankful for that mm -hmm. because this is how they get their exposure. And what you're doing with that, I think, is really fabulous, you know, to be able not, not just to enjoy doing it, but to be as magnanimous to give these people a, a slot. I mean, because there's a lot of open mics. And, you know, like you said, you go in, you sign up or whatever. Yours is much more crafted. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's kind of more... Curated, of, yeah, and it's more of a privilege or an honor to be able to play on any given 10 by 3 night. Mm -hmm. Just for that very reason alone. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the musicians that do play it I know I do uh, really appreciate that opportunity to do it. So um, for anybody that wants to get involved in the 10 by 3, um, how do you email me up? at the10x3 at gmail.com. The 10 by 3? Yeah. Or they can go to my website, which is brentkirby.com, and there's a 10 by 3 page, and there's a submission uh, entry there as well. Brent? Thank you so much, my Thank friend. You. Yeah, appreciate like I you said, everything you do. The hardest working man in show business in Cleveland. I think you can understand why now. Yeah, Thank thanks. you, Brent. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.